Our policy does not copy the laws of neighboring states. We are rather a pattern to others than imitators ourselves. It is called a democracy, because not the few, but the many govern. Thus spoke Pericles in his funeral oration in the year 431 BC. It was the end of the first year of the Peloponnesian War, and Athens held a public funeral for those who had fallen in the war, and Pericles had the honour of giving a speech. Much of the speech is dedicated to the praise of Athens's greatness. If we look to the laws, they afford equal justice to all in their private differences. If a man is able to serve the state, he is not hindered by the obscurity of his condition. The freedom we enjoy in our government extends also to our ordinary life. We throw open our city to the world, and never by alien acts exclude foreigners from any opportunity of learning or observing, although the eyes of an enemy may occasionally profit by our liberality. Athens in the 5th century BC was a land of diversity and cultural growth. How is it possible that this single century produced Herodotus and Thucydides, the two most famous Greek historians, Plato and Socrates, who laid the bedrock of dialectic and philosophy for centuries to come, and Aeschylus, Sophocles and Euripides, some of the finest playwrights in history? It would be stupid to claim that one man was responsible for unleashing the genius of all these people. On the other hand, it would be remiss not to mention the part he played in providing a nurturing environment for these minds. That one man we're talking about was, of course, Pericles. Pericles was born in Athens in 495 BC. His father, Xanthippus, was exiled following his rivalry with Themistocles, a populist political figure, but he was recalled when the Persians made their second incursion into Greece in 480 BC. He led the Athenian naval forces in the Battle of Mycale and married Agaristi of the Alcmaeonidae, who, when pregnant, saw in her sleep a vision in which she thought she gave birth to a lion. In a few days she bore Xanthippus a son, Pericles. While Xanthippus had an aristocratic palate, Agarist was the niece of Cleisthenes, a very important figure in the development of Athenian democracy. Solon introduced democratic reforms in Athens unsuccessfully, but it was Cleisthenes who implemented these ideas. Historians refer to Cleisthenes of the Alcmaeonidae as the father of Athenian democracy. So Pericles, whose name means surrounded by glory, grew up between the aristocratic indulgences of his paternal side and the democratic attitude of his maternal family. Learning music from the sophist Damon and philosophy from Protagoras, Zeno and Anaxagoras at an early age, he developed a progressive mindset toward arts, culture and statesmanship. Anaxagoras, who taught that the sun was just a fiery stone larger than the Peloponnese Peninsula, became a close friend and influenced him greatly. Later, he will be accused of impiety for such teachings and forced into exile. However, it is possible that the accusations against Anaxagoras were just an indirect attack on Pericles himself. In Pericles's day and age, philosophy was just a pastime of the sophists, but he emphasized its use in politics. Cleisthenes had provided a practical format for Solon's reforms, and Pericles came to improve upon these ideas. In ancient Athens, however, being a staunch supporter of democracy had some caveats. Remember Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, all those advocates of logos, logic, they all kept slaves, and Aristotle even claimed that slavery was the natural way of things, and was in fact beneficial. Women, slaves and foreigners could not vote in the Athenian democracy. Nevertheless, Pericles affected the artistic, cultural and political ideas of Athens to such a degree that Thucydides called him the first citizen of Athens. Although Pericles had military ambitions in his youth, he entered politics in his twenties. His first recorded act was the financial sponsorship of Aeschylus's play, The Persians, in 472 BC. This act of patronage demonstrated that he was one of the wealthier men of Athens. The play presents the Battle of Salamis, in which Themistocles led the Athenians to a victory. It can be argued that by choosing this play, Pericles aligned himself with a pro-democratic Themistocles, who was in political struggle with his rival, Cimon, who was sympathetic to the Spartans and was the leader of the Conservative Party. Soon, 
Chemon managed to get Themistocles ostracized. In a bid to exact revenge, Pericles claimed that Chemon was taking bribes from foreign powers. In 461 BC, he became the leading prosecutor in a case accusing Chemon of aiding Sparta and jeopardizing Athenian interests, damaging his credibility and ousting him from politics. In the same year, the Democratic Party with its leader Ephialtes moved to decrease the power of Areopagus, a traditional council controlled by the Athenian aristocracy, and Ecclesia, the assembly of the Athenian citizens, adopted the reforms. The Democrats became dominant party in the city. Shortly after, Ephialtes was murdered, and Pericles succeeded him as the leader of the party. With Chemon out of the way, there was no real opposition, so he was effectively the leader of the city. For a long time, Hoplite was the base of Athenian military power. Hoplite was a heavily armed infantry soldier that wore bronze armor breastplates, helmets and shin guards for protection. He had a shield, a short sword and an eight-foot long spear. These infantrymen fought in a tight formation called phalanx. Army was the key to Athenian power until Themistocles managed to persuade his fellow citizens to use the profits from their silver mines to build a navy. Themistocles knew that the Persians, who lost the Battle of Marathon in 490 BC, would return once more, this time with a huge army that the Greeks will not be able to oppose. From then on, Themistocles gradually directed his city towards the sea, thinking that their infantry was no match even for their neighbours, while they would be able not only to suppress the barbarians, but to rule the whole of Hellas with the power of their ships. And as Plato says, he made boatmen and sailors out of unwavering heavy infantrymen. The free citizens of Athens replaced the spear with an oar and created the famous Athenian navy. Pericles will only increase this force. He will create an Athenian naval alliance called the Delian League that will eventually dominate the eastern Mediterranean. Athens became the centre of the Greek world. Maritime trade brought enormous wealth to the city. But in addition to the money from trade, there was also income from allies from the Delian League. Even when the danger from the Persians disappeared, the Athenians, despite the protest of their allies, continued to collect tribute. Pericles used that money for one of the largest public works programs in history. One of the most beautiful cities in history was built under his leadership. In the wars with the Persians, Athens was destroyed, and Pericles began to rebuild the city. The first big project started in 447 BC, when the construction of Parthenon began. By the time the First Peloponnesian War commenced in 460 BC, the Delian League had existed for almost 20 years. Since Athens and Sparta were wary of each other's power, the Athens-led Delian League went to war against the Spartan-led Peloponnesian League. In 453 BC, Pericles led his forces as the commander-in-chief against Corinth, and in 443 BC he was elected as Strategos. After inconclusive results in the war, a truce was agreed upon. Chemon returned from his exile and acted as an intermediary between the two groups. In 449 BC, Pericles issued the Congress Decree, inviting Greek states to talk about the prospect of a unified country. When Sparta refused, hostilities continued for a few more years until another truce was established. In 445 BC, Pericles came into contact with Aspasia of Miletus, a foreign-born intellectual and teacher. He had gotten married in his early twenties, but after divorcing his wife, he began a relationship with Aspasia. This gave his political rivals a chance to launch another campaign to slander his name. In his middle age, the introverted man developed into a great orator. Since he had not exhibited these characteristics as a young man, they accused Aspasia of Miletus of teaching him tricks of seducing people. They even claimed that she wrote some of his marvellous speeches, including the funeral oration. Some historians claim that Pericles did not legally marry Aspasia, falling prey to his own law, which we'll mention in a while. As she was not from Athens, they had cohabited in the same house. Others, however, argue that they were married. Be that as it may, Pericles was heavily influenced by her ideas. He rebuilt and expanded the Agora, constructed the temples of the Acropolis, including the Parthenon, and turned the city of Athens into a cultural hub 
unlike any other in the world. Athens in the 5th century had two major political bodies, the Archons and the Strategoi. The Archon Eponymus, the Archon Polemarch, and the Archon Basilius initially served for life, but with democratic norms, their service time was reduced to a single year and their responsibilities to mere civic roles. While the Archons were selected by randomly drawing slots in the assembly, the ten Strategoi were elected by the citizens, which basically means Athenian-born free men. These were generals or military leaders who ran the city. Theoretically, they had equal power, but like in any democracy, the more charming and popular leaders were able to throw their weight around and outmaneuver their peers with ease. The Conservative Party supported the aristocratic political assembly of Areopagus, while the Democratic faction supported the assembly of the people or Ecclesia that convened forty times a year. Ecclesia in the age of Pericles played an important political and bureaucratic role, for instance, electing the justices for the judiciary. By this point in time, Pericles had come to understand the power of rhetoric, and he was willing to use it flagrantly for political means. He proposed that poor people of the city should be allowed to watch plays without paying their due share, since it would help elevate the cultural and intellectual level of the population. The wealthy were expected to sponsor theatre, including playwrights and actors. Greek theatre, as we know it today, was invented in the 5th century BC. Not to mention the birth of Western philosophy, from Socrates' Bohemian ramblings captured in Plato's writings to the establishment of Plato's Academy and Aristotle's Lyceum. Hippocrates, whose Hippocratic Oath medical practitioners take to this day, practiced medicine in Pericles' Athens. Phidias created the statue of Zeus at Olympia, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Myron produced his sculptural masterpiece, the Disc Thrower, and the painter, Polygnotus, painted buildings in the Acropolis. Pericles decreased the property requirements for archonship, but he also made the controversial decision to restrict citizenship to individuals of Athenian parentage on both sides. After his relationship with Aspasia, he rescinded this law in later life. By enacting legislation favouring the lower classes, he increased their chances to enter public offices and political circles. The Athenian population in the 5th century BC is suggested to be around 250,000. Out of these people, around 50,000 had full-fledged civil rights. Now that figure may seem low, and it is, but these people were heavily involved in day-to-day -day social events. The members of the Council of 500 were selected by lot and played an important role in the legislation. Between the Ecclesia and the Council, the people had control over what happened in every aspect of politics, including war. Pericles lived to see his two sons die of a plague, and Athens enter the Second Peloponnesian War in 431 BC, one that they would end up losing. However, he did not live to see his city fall, as he died of a plague in 429 BC. It seems fitting to close with Thucydides' words, praising Pericles' statesmanship. The reason Pericles was such a superior statesman was that he was strong in both repute and intellect, and was conspicuously incorruptible. He held the masses on a light rein and led them, rather than let them lead him.